In this video, I'm marking 30 years of the Land Rover Discovery and feeling quite old. So yes, it really is um, 30 years since the um, Land Rover Discovery was launched upon the world. Um, it was Land Rover's, only Land Rover's third ever um, new design. Uh, it was the classic lifestyle vehicle um, designed for um, families to be sporty and adventurous in and um, developed with um, the usual um, tight-fisted budget of not very much um, during the Austin Rover era and uh, cleverly using Range Rover underpinnings. In fact, very, very much of this car is Range Rover. So um, the entire body structure underneath, um, the, the scuttle, the um, windscreen and uh, the frame to which all the out side panels are attached is all pure Range Rover. Uh, slightly truncated chassis, slightly shorter at the back, reduced overhang compared to a Range Rover, but otherwise it is very very much a Range Rover. So um, this is a vehicle launched in 1989, but at the time of launch the underpinnings were already sort of, um, let's think about this, um, 19 years old. Sorry, not very good with numbers. Quite extraordinary in itself that they managed to make it look so fresh and so different. Uh, I have seen one with a Range Rover front end grafted on because you, you can kind of do that. Uh, the panel pressings are slightly different, so they're not straight Range Rover doors. There are some mild changes. You've got this sort of seam line that runs down the side is a bit softer than the feature line on a Range Rover. I apologize for the plane buzzing around overhead. That's just typical. Uh, this example has a few things that make it look slightly wrong. It shouldn't have Land Rover on the bonnet there and it shouldn't have these later Discovery alloy wheels either. What I'd really set it off is a set of the original steel wheels. Um, absolutely lovely design. But I'm not quite sure how Land Rover avoided a lawsuit from Ford because the front end, the grille treatment, the headlamps, the indicators, very, very reminiscent of a Mark II Transit facelift. But um, there we go, they got away with it. But look at the ground clearance. This is the days when off-roaders were actually proper off-roaders. And uh, we can see under here, um, classic beam axle. Um, Range Rover uses beam axles with coil springs, uh, disc brakes all round, uh, permanent four-wheel drive, which means you don't start getting stuck and then select four-wheel drive as you do in most of the Japanese off-roaders. All four wheels are permanently driven. You can lock the center differential to ensure drive goes front and rearwards, which should mostly get you, uh, stop you from being stuck. But quite a large car by the standards of lifestyle vehicles today. Uh, originally a three door only. This is a slightly later one on an H plate. It's a very early fuel injected five door uh, V8. Oh yes, V8. And um, yeah, you'll notice the raised roof with the Alpine lights. The Alpine lights are a nod to the Defender. Raised roof adds extra practicality, extra height, means the rear seat can be mounted slightly up so the rear occupants can see out over the front. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very, very fond of the Discovery. Uh, I remember being very excited about it as a childhood. Uh, ignore the slightly falling down bit of trim because Land Rover. Um, and you know, subtle details like these. Um, actually, you know what? I might spin her around for a look at the back. Um, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll go and do that and we can have a look at the back end. But let's take in the front at the moment and the magnificence of the bonnet. And just a very pleasing design, I think. Um, I, I think they did very well given the limitations, i.e. you have a Range Rover, make it look not like a Range Rover. Under the bonnet, we find the ubiquitous Rover V8 engine here in 3528cc form. Um, I think 218 cubic inches, but that is a rough guess off the top of my head. Um, uh, with fuel injection, the in first discoveries only had um, twin carbs, but by the time they introduced the five door, I think they'd upgraded to fuel injection, which of course is better all round. Uh, this one has a cone filter on it for some reason for extra grr. Uh, sadly, it also has an exhaust manifold leak, so it will be sounding fruity once we get underway. Um, plenty of space to work on it, and uh, the initial engine options were um, this um, 3.5 litre V8 or Land Rover's new TDI diesel engine. I 
corker of an engine, very agricultural, but that feels appropriate for a, a bulky off-road vehicle like this. Um, they did later introduce a 2.0-litre MPI, which was the um, M-Series Rover engine, 16 valve, 134 brake horse, but um, yeah, not really quite enough um, engine for this amount of car. I think these V8s in fuel injected form were about 190 brake horsepower and um, quite a lot of torque. Uh, here in the rear aspect, um, I, I, I think the Discovery is um, working very, very nicely. I, I love the shape. Um, you'll notice the clever use of Maestro van rear lights, but they're nice rear lamp clusters. I don't think that's too bad at all. Uh, big chunky tow bar, lots of them have tow bars, act like a plough when you're off-roading. We've also got the um, original style alloy wheels, so um, that's what it would have had. It uh, wouldn't have had the steelies, it looks like it would have had um, a full set of alloys from new. Also got the um, rear window with um, a considerable um, offset on it, a key discovery feature, which they tried replicating with the um, number plate holder on the Discovery 5 with tragic results. Um, so yeah, the, the wheel sort of curves up and around and um, the, the wiper arms always get bent because people try and change the blade while it's still on. So yeah, they often end up actually, you can see it's been rubbing on the car there. I might even try and unbend it a little, try and save the poor thing. Um, perhaps not the best design. To make it easier to change the wiper blade, you should first remove the wheel. Um, and they're heavy as well, which makes the whole um, rear door assembly quite heavy. So the hinges um, often suffer. There's this big stabilizing bar on the bottom. But um, this is one of the nice features. Not allowed by legislation anymore. Oh gosh, that hasn't been out for a while, I don't think. There we go. Little jump seat in the back. Um, you're not allowed side facing seats anymore. So those have effectively been outlawed. Quite a clever design. Uh, this also has the optional accessory look, little stowage bag uh, on the back, which uh, in this case contains a warning triangle. Um, that's quite jolly. It must be genuine Rover, maybe. Oh no, that's a Mercedes. That's been nicked out of a Merc. Uh, split folding rear seat, and it's very easy to fold as well. You just press the button, and down it goes, and then it flips forward noisily on its rusty hinges. So yeah, all well and good. This model has the twin sunroofs as well and um, yeah and, and the slightly damaged trim. That's just got soggy and lost all its rigidity unfortunately. But uh, it's still better than the one I owned. Go and see the video on that one if you don't believe me. Uh, right, I'm going to jump into the back. Um, nice easy access here and we're in. Well here in the rear I've got all the headroom in the world. I could wear a top hat back here and the elevated position gives me a good view over the front seat so um, a good view of the road ahead. Uh, Legroom is pretty decent even when you've got a stash of um, service history in the uh, map pocket here and uh, yeah all this delicious sonar blue. Um, uh, Jasper Comran designed the interior and uh, I think people were expecting a, a bit more sexy times with, with the interior. Um, I've just noticed we've got um, little headrest covers here. Normally it'd be all exposed with a bar through the middle. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I quite like it. The, the cloth trim is quite classy, I think. Um, so while it may have disappointed some people who were expecting the designer to bring a bit more um, uh, I don't know, uh, vibrance to the interior. I think overall they did a good job. And um, I like the huge blue steering wheel, the blue dashboard, and uh, we've got the controls here for the five-speed gearbox and ahead of it, um, the um, dual ratio transmission. You'll note down there, we've actually got the accessory back as well, part of the Jasper Comran kit. And uh, unfortunately, no stereo. But um, yeah, all mod cons are included in this example. So um, yeah, I, I think it is perhaps with the interior that this car best hides its um, Range Rover origins. Because I mean, the dashboard is a lot better than an equivalent 1990 Range Rover. They were still very, very piecemeal, the Range Rovers at this time. So we've got nice clear um, gauges in front of us, very standard Austin Rover at the time with a little warning lamp panel in the middle of the dash. 
and um, there, there's some um, warning lights not very easy to see with the contrast I'm afraid uh, the the um, buttons here are quite visible where you are but when you come back to where I am um, they're mostly obscured which is a bit of a pain we've got wiper controls over here we've got rear fog light and heated rear window there and a few blanking plugs to play with too um, slightly convoluted heater controls but you can actually set it for fresh air to the face even when you've got the heater on so that's a clear boon um, you don't often get that um, this is the trusty old LT77 transmission um, 77 is a measurement not um, 1977 and um, reverse is next to first but quite easy to avoid reverse by mistake um, the later R380 gearbox has reverse below fifth and there's the little control down here which does um, it's in high range at the moment We've got low range for off-roading and a diff lock to lock the um, front and rear axles together if needs be um, in my experience very rarely needed um, ashtrays in the doors um, a little cubby a nice big grab handle huge sun visors um, absolutely enormous so uh, you can see how enormous by the um, size of the mirror um, but um, I think that's enough prevaricating. I think we need to fire this noisy beast up and go for a drive. All right, then, interior trim quality is not the greatest, perhaps, um, but um, let's fire her up. I'm just gonna adjust that mirror up, actually. That's not quite in the right place for me. There we go, the electric mirrors actually work. The passenger mirror on your side doesn't. Your window works. Look, I can make you go up and down quite nicely. In fact, that might even be a better angle. Uh, open the rear one, I'm gonna open my window as well. All the better to hear the slightly knackered exhaust. The pedals are huge and the control's fairly heavy. Um, clutch isn't too bad, not as bad as my old TDI. You can hear the viscous fan roaring away at the moment. That'll quieten down momentarily. And away we go. This example's got 173 and a half thousand miles on the clock. And I think that's a, a good reminder of, uh, um, actually a lot of these Land Rovers have covered an awful lot of miles. I have a feeling mine had done similar. So, I mean, they can't be that awful, can they? The suspension is notably firmer than a Range Rover. The Range Rovers had self-leveling rear suspension. These just had stiffer suspension. Uh, to, to make them um, less prone to sagging their backsides than a Range Rover. But it does mean the ride is not as comfortable. Range Rovers, you know, you paid extra for the comfort. See if the fan will quieten down in a minute. There it goes. So the viscous fan has realized it's not hot enough, so it has stopped turning at engine speed, which is why it's now a bit quieter. Oh! We haven't done a wiper test yet, have we? Um, here we go. Pretty large wipers. Sadly, this example does have a triangle of doom going on, but I think if that passenger arm was adjusted up a bit, it would get rid of that. I don't remember mine having a triangle of doom like that. Same stalks you'd find in an Austin Maestro or a Montego, but um, that's no bad thing. They have a nice feel to them. And uh, I think we'll go this way. Even with a blowing exhaust, that sounds nice. The major difference between these and the TDI. Quite a good gear change. This is clearly quite a good gearbox. Second gear is a little on the crunchy side. The Synchro Mesh does tend to wear, but at 173,000 miles, uh, I don't think I can really complain. Uh, but lovely commanding driving position. Uh, you sit so high up. So you're looking down on the Vauxhall mockers. They do roll around a bit in the corners, not as much as a Range Rover on account of being that little bit lighter. But overall, very pleasant things to drive. Lovely um, seats, the seats are quite firm. Uh, again, I imagine uh, that was to stop competing too much with the comfort of a Range Rover. But massive side windows and a huge windscreen 
mean, your visibility is truly excellent. And the huge rear window as well, of course. So the Discovery was launched in 1989 and um, really when the lifestyle vehicle was very much um, becoming the most popular, fashionable um, 4x4. Uh, vehicles like the Mitsubishi Shogun, the Isuzu Trooper, starting to steal sales from Land Rover, slotting in to the chasm of a gap between the agricultural Defender and the um, Range Rover at the top of the market, very much the luxury vehicle. So I think at launch these were about £15,000 if I remember rightly. And I, I really enjoyed mine. Mine was a terrible example and broke down quite often. Um, but I, I still enjoyed it nonetheless. And um, off-road, sadly we're not going to do any off-roading in this test. If you go and look at my earlier test, I did do some off-roading in that. Um, absolutely astonishing because there is plenty of suspension travel. The chassis design was by Spen King. Uh, who um, designed the Rover P6 as well, also had very long travel suspension and it was Spenking who realised that applying such long travel suspension to an off-roader could have real benefits in terms of on-road and off-road comfort rather than the bone-shaking leaf springs of a Series 3 and eventually that long travel suspension made it on the, to the 90 and 110 uh, which replaced the series Land Rovers and evolved into the Defender. Uh, annoys me if anyone uses the Defender tag on a Land Rover made before 1990. That was the first use of the Defender tag to tie in with the Discovery and Range Rover. But we're just bumbling along here behind a Renault Capture, fifth gear, uh, 1500 revs, all of the torque. This is effortless progress. Um, but yeah, put your foot down and she does sound quite marvellous. Uh, typically, this is the fens and the roads here are perhaps not the most exciting. But the Discovery brand really um, made an impact on the market. And while other companies launched rivals, the Discovery was pretty much untouchable for its off-road behaviour. Um, the Nissan Terrano two-stroke Ford Maverick got pretty close but I don't think it managed to feel so refined as a road car as this. Uh, actually quite good off-road. Oh, it's a shame about that dicky exhaust. It is ruining the um, ambiance somewhat. So the downside of the V8 obviously is horrendous first. Um, 20 mpg is frankly pushing it a bit. Um, Although more likely than the twin carbs, where 15 was pretty much as good as it was ever going to get. Tractor's going right, so I think we shall go left. But yeah, quite a big lump of car. Um, so trying to slot them into parking spaces, not that good, which is why uh, the Freelander ended up slotting in beneath. Right, we seem to find ourselves with a straight section of road at a standstill, so um, acceleration. Sixteen. A good, good road to test those coil springs as well. So there we go, the Land Rover Discovery. Um, still a car I hold in very high regard, even though mine was quite rubbish really, and this one has a few foibles. Pfft, they all do. Foibles worth living with, I think. And uh, I think what really shines through for me is the engineering. It just shows um, how um, a bit of British know-how goes a long way. You've got the limitations of um, a steering box, beam axles, ancient technology, yet the road manners are frankly superb. That It doesn't feel limited by those. And um, with long travel suspension front and rear, it's a fairly comfortable ride, not as comfortable as a Range Rover. But um, yeah, a world away from many a modern car. And just the light interior, it's airy, it's spacious. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot to love here. And th these first generation discos are starting to get pretty rare now. 
And uh, I've known this car for about four years now. That's how long um, Kelsey Media has owned it. And um, yeah, sadly it's going to a new home and um, I shall miss it. But I'm glad I finally got a chance to take it for a drive and do a video on it. I have been waiting a number of years for such an opportunity. It's just taken a while to arrange. Welcome to my world. But yeah, as you can tell, I really, really like it. I hope you like it too. Um, don't forget to subscribe before you go. Um, there's also the Hubnut store where you can buy t-shirts and mugs and stickers, etc., to apply to your vehicle and uh, drink tea out of and wear. And you can decide which items do which. Um, but yeah, overall, brilliant. And I look forward to seeing you in a future video. Farewell. How remiss of me, I almost forgot the rear wiper. Good times.